Good evening. Welcome to our Youth Ministries Department Black History Program. Black History in Houston is our history, it's our theme. We hope you enjoy the presentation. My name is Joseph Brown. Next year, we hear the Youth Ministry Orchestra playing Lift Every Voice and Sing. The members are Calvin Williams on the baritone saxophone, Trevion Charles on the trombone, Mr. Jones on the trumpet, Trinity McCleary on the saxophone, and Edith Posey on the violin. Carter Jerome. The significance of black history makers in Houston and the black history in Houston is our history. Black History Month remains a powerful, symbolic celebration and a time for acknowledgement, reflection, and inspiration. Carter G. Woodson is the father of black history. Mr. Woodson was a scholar whose dedication to celebrating the historic contributions of black Americans led to the establishment of Black History Month, celebrated every February since 1976. Mr. Woodson fervently believed that Black Americans should be proud of their heritage and all Americans should understand the largely overlooked achievements of Black Americans. Black History Month is that time for Black Americans to acknowledge key figures from the past and present. Black history should not be a celebration that comes and goes in our minds and homes. Black history in Houston is our history. We have Black Americans in H-Town who have made significant contributions to the American society. These H-Town residents are upholding the traditions and values of this country and are pillars of our identity. Our Black History Program will introduce you to these H-Town residents. There are five reasons to celebrate this Black History Month with us. There's still a lot to learn about Black history. Black history unites us. Celebrating differences has countless benefits. We can better understand how important our own stories are. And Black History Month reminds us to dig deeper and think bigger. Black History Month stands as a reminder to all of us to reimagine what new heights are achievable and to set our course to make history or to be trailblazers. Thank you for joining us and we pray that you will be blessed. And now our Black History Month program. 
Montoya Murray is a nine-year-old fourth grader who attends Blackshell Elementary where the Pride of Third War begins. And I'm the librarian, Miss Eaglin, and our principal is Dr. Stradick Thomas. Montoya is the only child born to Sean and Shadonette Murray. As a master scholar who loves reading, acting, dancing, and drawing, she was living a normal life until it changed overnight. After winning first place in the Foley and Lardner competition, their MLK oratory competition, her video went viral and her life changed. But Toya has since been on a local television show, news stations, and most recently she was featured on the Sherry Shepherd Black History Show. Little Miss Murray is known as our pint-sized powerhouse who loves her faith, family, and friends. She is a member of the Fountain of Praise Church, where Pastor Remus Wright is a senior pastor. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Montoya Monet Murray. How I got over? How I got over? My soul looks back in wonder. How I got over? I was there, yes, I was there 60 years ago to witness a great champion of the civil rights movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tell us about his dream. The crowd was massive at the March on Washington, filled with freedom fighters from every walk of life. Dr. King was originally supposed to say a speech written by his former advisor. Since I had just sang, I've been buked and I've been scorned on the podium, I was still close enough for him to hear me say, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. Immediately, Martin slid his nose to the side and began to preach his electrifying, I have a dream speech. What a time we had. If Dr. King could reflect on the 60 years since his I Have a Dream speech, Martin's reflection would be a confession of the goodness of God. First, he would thank God for bringing us over. He would say, Mahalia, I kept on dreaming. Thank you for singing at every rally and every march. We've made it over. King couldn't help but to reflect on how John Lewis gathered young adults together to fight for change in the Selma to Montgomery March. In 1965, he would recall his how long, not long speech he gave after the march. He predicted that equal rights for African Americans would be granted. Dr. King would shout, thank God we made it over. Less than six months later, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. My speech sparked a movement of equality, which helped create the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, ending racial segregation in the United States. But there is still work to be done globally. Do you know how many sleepless nights I had? Hey! Thank God we made it over. Dr. King would be thankful for the awards for his achievements. The Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1977, and the Congressional Gold Medal in 1994. With tears in his eyes, Dr. King would reflect on the 60 years since his I Have a Dream speech and cry out, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. At the March on Washington, I told the crowd, with this faith, we would be able to work together, pray together, struggle together, stand up for freedom together, knowing that we would be free one day. Today, we have risen from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the solid path of racial justice. We have made justice a reality, and my children have carried on my legacy. Even my beautiful granddaughter has her own platform. Americans have the right to go to the same restaurants, 
movie theaters, schools, and churches. Barack Obama wasn't just a candidate, but became the first black president. Kamala Harris, you see, became the first female VP. Dr. King's last words would be to you. He would say, my life was worth sacrificing because I was fighting for you. You deserve the right to a free public education. You deserve to have teachers who care, and not just warm bodies there. We fought for equal rights so that you can have a blank check. So go back home and check your cash app. You have been given back pay that America defaulted on. Go back to school and get a great education. Instead of using AI, artificial intelligence, to do all of your classwork, just be I. Be intelligent. Be intelligent enough to know that a dream won't become a reality overnight. Yes, they may have killed the dreamer, but couldn't kill the dream. Thank God I made it over. Thank you. I'm here today with Mr. Joseph Anderson, owner and operator of the Chick-fil-A location in Houston, Texas on I-45 South in Almeda, Genome. Um, what first interested you in becoming a business owner? How you doing, one man? Um, great question. So uh, a ton of different things, but to keep the answer simple. So there were three main reasons why I wanted to become an entrepreneur. Uh, one, the intrinsic values, but let me really state that three things as to why I wanted to be an entrepreneur with Chick-fil-A and partner with them. Um, one, the intrinsic value. So growing up, I didn't have a lot. My family, we didn't have a lot. It was a family of five of us. Uh, however, the one thing that we had that was the most consistent was dinner every single day. And it was a time where we could just come together and talk through the day, our feelings, emotions, whatever uh, was, was going on during the time. We had that every single day. Uh, Friday was my mom's day off, so we didn't we had to fend for ourselves on Friday, but uh, that was one. Two, the opportunity to continue to be with individuals who I believe are smarter than me, uh, who continue to push me, and it gives me this platform to continue also to develop young great leaders to the future. And then the third one, I, I, I'm a big believer that if you go into business, you should want to make money, right? And uh, I wanted to do those three things. And being able to do it with Chick-fil-A has been such a blast. I started in the restaurant industry, I mean, good Lord, sometime in college, but I started with Chick-fil-A in 2012. And um, I mean, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a blessing um, and it's, it's taken off since. Um, what kind of goals did you set uh, to accomplish uh, for your objective? Um, so I knew that I wanted to be an operator. So the, after I had that understanding of wanting to be an operator, it was just trying to understand what are the things that I needed to do to prepare. I think the biggest thing was understand what leadership is and was, or was and is rather. Um, and after understanding how I can be a better leader, how I can be a better uh, communicator, um, and then understanding not just business, but also the restaurant and tying those two things together. So would that mean, you know, understanding what's going on in the economy, what's going on in the political landscape, but also what's going on in the quick service restaurant industry in that landscape and pairing all of that knowledge together. But I think the most important thing that I've been able to learn is how do you show up for people? Being able to show up for people um, and meeting them where they are Okay, yeah. Um, what challenges did you face? Uh, too many to list. <laughs> um, the first time that I actually interviewed to become an owner operator, I got told no. And uh, that was tough because I felt like I had done everything that I needed to do to prepare myself for the opportunity, but it was probably the best thing for me. I then went into what is known now as the leadership development program where I traveled for 27 months and you go around, I mean, the US and you open new restaurants or you're, you're running pre-established restaurants. And it gave me the opportunity to build my business acumen. It gave me the opportunity to, to really build my development story, my leadership development story, um, and build also 
revenue uh, to be prepared when the opportunity really did present itself. That opportunity presented itself in 2018. Um, I think the biggest challenge when I look back on that time that I had to um, endure and over overcome was learning to lead through tragedy. Uh, I lost my my father in 2016, and oh no, man! Um, during that time frame, that it that was the first tragedy or death experience transition that that I've ever experienced of that magnitude, right? So having to deal with that pressure personally, but also still leading God professionally. And it taught me, cause I used to separate both the worlds, where it's the personal and the professional. And it taught me that um, you don't get to separate that. And it's very challenging to do it if you're going to be a leader. So I had to learn how to be a little bit more transparent. I had to learn how to be a little bit more vulnerable. Um, I gained a lot more empathy from that, from, from that experience with my father. And that made me a better leader, believe it or not. Yes. Um, I'm a participant in the Chick-fil-A leadership program or academy at Straight Jesuit. Okay. Um, how do you think this program prepares teens uh, for the future as contributors or leaders to society? So one kudos to you for uh, being a part of that program, man, because I get to I have a leadership uh, development partnership with the school near my restaurant. And I will tell you, it's really fascinating, very unique. I think that it gives you an opportunity to, to place yourself uh, uh, with a competitive advantage, well ahead of other students who are in your class um, and your range. That, that program teaches you how to properly communicate, understanding again the, fun, the fundamentals, the key fundamentals of what leadership is and how to go about serving others. So. I mean, I hope that you guys have been learning that, you've been experiencing that. A good portion of leadership and what we try and do with Chick-fil-A is, again, meet people where they are. Uh, how can we be the world's most caring company? So by doing that, you have to meet someone where they are. How do you care for them? How do you become a servant leader? And that class, man, will unpack all of that. So I would tell you to maximize it, leverage, but also apply it. Um, what advice do you have for, for people like my age trying to become an entrepreneur? Oh man, so much, so much. Let me, let me ponder on that one. Uh, so you're in 11th grade, right? Uh, my, my advice is fail forward, right? Don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's okay, right? I tell my team all the time, we don't fail, we learn. Make, make the mistakes, um, but try your best not to make the same mistake twice. All right. Um, leaders read. Read, man. Uh, we take reading for granted. Leaders read and so much knowledge in books that's hidden. So I would I would tell you to continue to develop yourself. Um, don't let and, you know, you talked about where you potentially want to go to, to college. Um, don't let education get in the way of your education. And what I mean by that is while yes, there's the academic scholastic part of college and even where you are right now in high school, um, what are you doing outside of that realm to continue to develop yourself, culture yourself, understand what, what other uh, cultures do, how they interact, uh, and then how do you apply that to become a better leader, a better person? So how do you go about adding value? I think that's the biggest thing that I would, if you hear nothing from me today, Find a way to continue to add value to others, because when you add value to someone else, um, your growth will be exponential. I got one last question. Though. Like, if um, if somebody wants to work at Chick Fil A, how do you think Chick Fil A helps to build that person? Like, like is it a good job? <laughs> Man, uh, there's so much going on at Chick Fil A. So I, I think because it's such a fast-paced environment. Um, it definitely teaches you to some degree a little bit of patience. Um, I like to believe that it can teach you strategy because we're very streamlined. Um, we teach you a lot of hospitality. Um, this thing we call, or I call it mood meter, being able to determine someone's mood, um, whether it be a kid, whether it be a parent, whether it be um, 
a, an, an older adult. Um, there's a there's a lot, but communication probably again. I've seen people go from being extremely shy to by the time they transition out and graduate and go into college, they just have this burst of confidence, and you could see it, you could feel it. So that's the biggest thing that um, that I would say. Uh, no one person is the same when they come into my restaurant. I have 112 employees and they're all different. Um, so I, I try and meet them where they are and understand what it is that they need, um, what they desire. I think the biggest thing that I've learned, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. So when you understand that and practice it and apply it every single day, you typically get a return on investment. OK. Well, um, thank you for the interview. Absolutely, man. My pleasure. Continue to to to, to excel and, and, and be excellent, man, and do the great work that you're doing. Um, if there's anything I can do in your journey on, on becoming an entrepreneur, let me know. All right. Thank you. My pleasure. My name is Dayla Henderson. The history of Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church celebrating 64 years. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Psalm 126 verse three. Lily Grove Baptist Church has been a bright light shining on 3602 Drew Street with 30 members to 3550 Idaho to 7034 Tier Wester Street. The pastor of our bright and glowing church is Reverend Terry Keith Anderson serving us with 33 years of dedicated leadership. Reverend Carlos Washington, our executive pastor, has blessed us with 25 years of Christian service. The preached word is being received by 5,000 members and millions of others through radio, television broadcasts, various other streaming platforms, and social media. You may visit our website at www.lilygrove.org for additional information about our church story. Being led by the Spirit of God, Lily Grove will continue to walk, witness, work, and worship in exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinners. My name is Landon Thompson. Gospel music has a rich history in Houston, Texas. A few of the notable artists are James Fortune, Zacardi Cortez, Kathy Taylor, Lecrae, Kim Burrell, and many others in addition to gospel choirs. Today, Visions of Faith focus on the incomparable Miss Yolanda Adams. I've come through many hard trials Through temptations on every hand Though Satan's tried to stop me sinking sand through the pain and all of my sorrows through the tears and all of my fears the Lord was there to keep me for he's kept me in the midst of it all so faithful not because
could do it on my own. But Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Jocelyn Smith and I'm doing the Everyday Things created by African American Inventors. African American Inventors changed the way we live through their many innovations. From the three light traffic signal, improved ironing board, automa automated elevator doors, color monitor for desktop computers, laser treatment for cataracts, cellular phone, home security systems, blood banks, mailbox, clothes dryer, floating chairs, golf tee, modern toilet, pacemaker, potato chips, touch tone telephone, thermostat, caller ID, hair care products for black women, pencil sharpener, fountain pen, lawn sprinkler, fire extinguisher, kitchen table, peanut butter, hairbrush, curtain rod, doorknob, typewriter, air conditioner unit, tricycle, stethoscope, refrigerator, spark plug, hairbrush, dustpan, and the baby buggy. This is just a small list of inventions. Black Americans have accounted for more than 50,000 patents. There are so many fascinating inventions to learn about in February and beyond. Join us in learning about inventors who work hard to create products and systems that will benefit us for decades to come, often against staggering odds. With inventions, you can express your crea creativity ability. It is an amazing way to put your knowledge and ability to work. Change the course of history by discovering remarkable innovations. My name is Erin Smith. <clears throat> the biscuit cookie cutter was invented by Alexander Ashbourne in 1875. Mr. Ashbourne noted that the biscuit cookie cutter when used had to be hand padded and had no form. He wanted a uniform shape and size, so he invented the biscuit cookie cutter. Hi, my name is Zoe and I'll be talking about the almanac. The almanac is, was invented by Benjamin Binnaker in 1792. The Omnac is a book or tablet containing a calendar of the days, weeks, and months of the year. Mr. Binnaker was also a mathematician and astronomer. 
My name is Mariah Moore, and my speech is about pencil sharpeners. John L. Love invented the pencil sharpener in 1897. Prior to the invention, a knife was used to sharpen a pencil. This invention has been used for many years by schools, churches, businesses, and in homes. My name is Mackenzie Lewis. The child carriage was invented by William Kent in 1897. The child carriage is, is known today as a stroller. Before this invention, babies were pulled by a goat, dog, or small pony. Thank God for William Kent. Hello, my name is Madison Moore, and my poem, my speech, my speech is about French fries and American black soldiers in Belgium invented French fries during World War War One. The dominant language in Belgium is French. The tasty potatoes were called French fries. My name is Parker Thompson. George Speck, also known as George Crumb, invented potato chips in 1853. Mr. Speck changed his name to George Crumb. He was a chef in New York. A customer was upset about the potato chips he cooked. The customer got mad and sent the potatoes back to the kitchen. <laughs> he fried the potatoes as hard as he could. Potato chips were born. They're the world's biggest snack. What is your name? Paige pa 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 Thompson. And Paige, what are you going to talk about today? The... The peanut butter. Who invented the peanut butter? The peanut man. And what was his real name? George Washington Carver. Hello, my name is Trevion Charles Jr. And I would like to talk about African-American inventors and extraordinary inventions. African-Americans have made extraordinary contributions throughout history. We are going to highlight some of those contributions and encourage our community to boldly go after those things that represent a symbol of hope for our future generation. These inventors took advantage of their God-given talents to create products that simplify the lives of people all over the world. Many of you possess similar talents. It is time for us to leverage that talent energy, and creativity to make a difference. My name is Layla Myers. African-American inventors affect our daily lives. Whether we know it or not, African-American inventors impact our daily lives drastically. From the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, you use at least one item invented by an African-American inventor. Many African-American inventors struggled with through hardships, poverty, and in some cases, slavery. Still, they prevailed and proved their genius to the world. During this time, African Americans had little to no rights, which obviously made entering into the contractual legal, legal agreements quite difficult. Many African Americans lost or never gained legal rights to their inventions, and those who were fortunate enough to gain patents were seldom recognized. Many slaves who were inventors automatically lost rights to their inventions to their slave masters. My name is Calvin Williams, and I'm doing a house door mailbox. Mr. Philip Downey, invented the house door mailbox in 1891. As a solution to visiting the post office every time he wanted to mail a letter, Mr. Downing invented the first, first outdoor mailbox that could keep the mail out of the rain and snow. My name is Kevin Williams. Mr. Robert F. Flemings Jr. invented a guitar-like instrument in 1886. He called it, it a euphonica. His guitar, produced a, his guitar produced a louder and richer sound than a traditional guitar. He was also a musician. My name is Andrew Roberson. Michael C. Harvey invented the lantern. He is also known for inventing an improvement in wick razor of the lantern. Michael C. Harvey invented the lantern in 1884.
My name is Shia Lewis, the helicopter. The helicopter was invented by Paul E. Williams. Mr. Williams designed and patented the Lockheed Model 186 helicopter model. Mr. Williams invented the helicopter in 1962. Good morning, my name is Reagan Henry, and I'm here interviewing Miss Jacqueline Bostick, the great-granddaughter of Reverend Jack Yates. She is also a board member and vice chair of the Emancipation Park Conservancy and long-standing community advocate in Houston and the nation. She is truly a black history trailblazer. I have a few questions for you. So we know that Reverend Jack Yates, who was a former slave and eventually a free man, was a great-grandfather. How do you describe his legacy and the impact it had in Houston? I would describe Reverend Jack Yates's legacy to Houston and the surrounding communities, one that of lasting value and impact on the community. Uh, for he provided lessons that we can learn from and continue to use today that impact our community as it applies to education, as it applies to business, economic empowerment, religious freedom and religious empowerment. He did so many things to impact our community that they're of lasting value even today. Okay, uh, how did it feel when you realized the impact your great grandfather had on life for African Americans in Houston? Well, it made me really feel very proud to realize that a person whom had been enslaved and a person that had no formal education could do so many things to make sure that a community existed for African Americans in this city. And so if a person that had been enslaved and lived under the kind of conditions that he came into the world and lived under, then certainly I can and you can, and anyone that wants to, can actually be a contributing member to the community in which they live. We also know that Reverend Jack Gates helped establish Freedman's Town. Uh, how did Freedman's Town come to exist, and what did it represent for former slaves? Well, Freedman's Town really came out of a vision for Reverend Jack Yates. As you are aware, at the time that he and his family came into the Houston area after being freed as former enslaved people, there were not, that was not a real community for African Americans in the city of Houston. And the people who came into the city out of slavery had to live in uh, tents on Buffalo Bayou. And so at that time, he had learned and knew how to do things that a lot of other people who were enslaved had not learned because of the experience that he had had with being in a family where his mother took care of the slave owner's child who was born at the same time he was born. So therefore, he knew and understood many things about a community and what it would take in order for people to have a community and prosper. So he knew that he had to help them in order for that to happen so that they could get out of the tents, that they could buy their own property, that they could uh, build their own homes, and that they could have their own community. So out of his vision, he was able to bring them into what we call today community. And so from the bio, and the area that surrounded the bio, he was able to buy property, buy property for people who wanted to buy it. He was able to pay their taxes for them. He was able to pay their notes for them. He made sure that if they bought it, they were able to keep it and that they were able to form a community. After he uh, was able to get that done, but prior to that, he started a church on the bio in what was called the Brush Arbor, and it was the first Baptist church for blacks in the uh, city of Houston. And so from the Buffalo Bayou and that Brush Arbor and that small church, uh, the church continued to grow, so it moved to uh, Rusk and Bagby Street, which is now part of the city hall complex. And so from there, it still was growing. So then they 
formed a trustee board and they bought two lots, which is now where the church stands today. It was Robin Street then, but it's now called Clay Street. And so in the church, he was able to help the other people in the community, especially the men and the women who had no idea of how to read and to write, how to do arithmetic, how to take care of money and things. He was able to teach them at night all those kinds of things. He was able to teach the boys and girls because there were no schools at that time for them, no public schools, to, to do the same thing during the day. And so out of that community, he helped them to build their own community. And so what you know today is a large part of downtown Houston and what's called Midtown Houston was a large part of what we know to be as Freedmanstown. That area has shrunk today because it's been taken over by downtown and Midtown. But it was a thriving community that was able to sustain itself where people were able to buy property, own property, start their own businesses, work for others, but be a community. Okay, so let's turn to Emancipation Park. Uh, how did having a place to celebrate Juneteenth impact the community? Well, it impacted it greatly, simply because, again, at that time, there were no places that uh, black men and women could go to other than to church and to work. That was simply part of the law. So if you could only go to church and to work, then you really didn't have any place to go to where you could have your own celebrations, where you could come together as a community and do things. And the people of that community always wanted to remember June 19th, the day that they were finally allowed to be free in the state of Texas. Even though they had been freed in 1863, the state of Texas, which had succeeded from the Union, decided it was not going to free their slaves. So therefore, people came from the North and the Northeast to bring the, their slaves, those who did not want to, to uh, stop ha having slaves, brought them to Texas. Jack Yates's wife was on a plantation in Virginia. He was from Virginia. He was freed, but in Virginia, the slave owner of his wife would not free him, his wife and his family. They came to Texas. And so he came to Texas in order to be with his wife and children and take care of his family. So what significant changes have you seen for African Americans in Houston uh, so far during your lifetime? Well, really, Reagan, I've seen so many. <laughs> Believe me, it, it would be hard for you to imagine because so many things that were one way when I was a child, I grew up in Freedmanstown. I went to Gregory Elementary School, which is now the Gregory Research Library for African Americans. I went to Booker T. Washington, which was located on Dallas Street which is where that, that school was located. There was also a Carnegie Library for African Americans. But all of that's a part of Allen Center downtown now. So I've watched the city of Houston literally change from what it was when I was a child, your age, to what it is today. And some areas have changed two and three times over, not just once. But some areas, if you haven't been to them in a year, you wouldn't know it was the same place. Oh, wow. So I've seen quite a few changes, not just for African Americans, but for this city as a whole. I see. Well, thank you for having me and for sharing your story. Why, well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. Hello, my name is Cameron Duggan. Today, it's a pleasure of interviewing. Mr. Justin Robinson III, President and CEO of the Houston Area Urban League. Mr. Robinson was a third generation Houstonian who's made great contributions to the city of Houston and African Americans and black African Americans in the city of Houston. 
Following the footsteps of his father, the late great Judge Robinson Jr., who was the first African American elected to the Houston City Council, he himself was elected to the Houston City Council from 1992 to 1997. He worked as an entrepreneur in corporate America, county government, and as a licensed realtor for a great accomplishment. Mr. Robinson is a truly, a truly a trailblazer in Black history. Mr. Robinson, I would like to ask you a few questions. Absolutely, Cameron. Pleasure to be here. How do you view your father as a trailblazer for African Americans' participation in, in local politics? Great question. Um, <clears throat> Judson Robinson Jr. Uh, really kind of grew up in a very strong household. Mom and dad were very uh, helpful in rearing their kids, lots of great discipline and uh, support for their kids. Um, my grandfather was a, was a minister, uh, so you can imagine that uh, there were rules and regulations, uh, but they were good guidance. Uh, my mother, my grandmother was a great homemaker, but also a great business person. And so my dad and his brother and sister just really had a, a very strong household upbringing. And, uh, you know, had a, had a great community. Uh, went to Jack Yates High School. Uh, you know, people took a lot of pride in their schools back in those days. Parents were very supportive of the kids. The educators were true role models and leaders, much like they are today. Uh, and so we kind of had, you know, that going for us. In addition, after he came out of a HBCU, uh, Fisk University up in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, he came back and joined the family business. And, you know, that's a, that's a real privilege and a benefit to not have to go and look for a job, but to actually have a father who's created something for you to follow in the footsteps of. Uh, so he became a realtor and, and began working in the family business and, and really kind of became the, the voice of Judson Robinson and Sons. And, uh, you know, we had a great opportunity to sell homes to black people because it was difficult for black people to buy homes, uh, to find mortgages, to get insurance for them, etc. And so they, they did really well in, in that space. Um, he uh, also kind of came up during the, the civil rights era. So, you know, we had the the, the great movement of the 60s, and you've heard all about that. It was kind of like, for your generation, our, our, our um, George Floyd moment, you know, when we all kind of came together and we all were one community working together and, and people were concerned about black issues. So that happened back in the 60s as well, just due to all the civil unrest that was taking place. So, you know, I think the timing was just really right for, um, interest in black people achieving, and he was just the man of the hour. Now we know that Pleasantville was the first master plan community in Houston <clears throat> for African Americans, but how is it beneficial to help African Americans become property owners? Well, I think Pleasantville offered, offered you a process. Uh, Pleasantville began with <clears throat> uh, a group of apartments that were close to a main street in Houston called Market Street. And Market was a very busy kind of commercial, uh, industrial uh, type uh, business avenue. And so there were opportunities for people to not only get an affordable apartment, but also to work close in proximity to where they lived. Uh, so that was a great kind of, you know, benefit to the people who lived in the community because, you know, you, you, you take cars and buses and stuff like that for granted these days. But back in those days, people may have had to walk to work. You know, uh, They may have you know, had to catch a ride with someone if somebody had a car. So uh, making stuff easier for people to do was, was important. And so <clears throat> um, the apartments were the first phase, if you will, of uh, Pleasantville. Uh, but then there came a second phase, so as people moved into the apartments, established their credit, had a history of, of working, et cetera. Uh, my granddad was able to get with some uh, developers and say, what if we went across the railroad tracks and actually build housing? And uh, the concept was accepted. And uh, with the help of these, uh, these developers, we were able to start building homes uh, uh, not too far from the not too far from the apartments, just across the tracks, as a matter of fact. 
And sure enough, um, homes were built. Um, you began to have a lot of community leaders who were really just really proud, you know, of, of what was taking place. They actually had uh, homes like uh, white people did. <laughs> you know, they had uh, access to jobs like white people did. I mean, this was somewhat unusual, unfortunately, uh, back in the late 50s and early 60s. But, you know, word spread. I remember seeing uh, advertisements in local black newspapers back in the day. And it had, you know, Pleasantville with a nice home and a big oak tree bud and a family, you know, standing in front of all caricatures, of course, but standing in front of this home with a driveway and a car in the garage. And, and, and obviously that was something that people just couldn't believe was possible. This is post-World War II and people were coming back with the GI Bills and, you know, trying to make a living for themselves and their families. And, you know, here you had a community where you had housing, you had um, opportunities to work not too far from where you live. Uh, perhaps your uh, relatives were living in the apartments, saving up to one day, maybe moving across the tracks to Pleasantville, you know, into the housing. So it was, uh, it was just um, a utopia for so many people because it was so unusual. Um, eventually we had schools and libraries and all the things that make community. And without community, uh, you're gonna have a lot of disjointedness. And, all, and Pleasantville uh, became that place of unity and opportunity. So what changes have you observed in the community in recent years? In recent years, I think, you know, obviously the housing stock is, is older now. Uh, unlike uh, almost, uh, like many uh, black neighborhoods, uh, you don't always have this infusion of new housing stock uh, that comes in. And of course, you know, the, the, the children of the parents want to move back into the neighborhood. We, we haven't yet crossed that bridge uh, where people see value in that. But I think people are starting to learn what happens when uh, you don't have new housing stock or the housing stock doesn't um, remain something that appeals to the younger generations coming up. And so when you, when you move away and others move in, uh, we see how that changes the face of the neighborhood, which you know, potentially changes the strength of our politics as well, because if you have different people moving into a neighborhood that used to be uh, kind of homogenous in terms of how they think and how they vote and what they believe, and then all of a sudden that changes, then that means that maybe your elected representatives will change. So people who have the same interests as you uh, might begin to change as well. But there's hope because I've seen, especially in Pleasantville, uh, the new leadership, uh, the civic engagement that's taking place from the uh, young women who've been, you know, kind of chairing the various committees and, and being president of the civic leagues for the last uh, several uh, generations. Uh, they are instilling that Pleasantville matters, uh, that history matters, that people need to know about what took place in history and how this is the type of history that needs to be repeated. And to know that black people could do something like what we did in Pleasantville. So I, I think it sends a strong message to your generation and to those a little bit older that if you put your foot down uh, and stand up for your ancestors and what they did on behalf of their communities, that uh, this is possible. So I'm, in, I'm encouraged by the spirit that I'm observing in Pleasantville and other communities across the country. As president and CEO of the Houston Area Urban League, how's the organization's core initiative help support the growth for wealth for African Americans? You know, we believe that, <clears throat> we believe that everything can be accomplished if there's a good process in place. Uh, the, the pathway to success is no secret, uh, but it can be difficult if you choose not to investigate how others did it. So if you want to become successful, uh, you can study what success looks like uh, by other people who've accomplished it, or you can choose to just try to figure it out on your own. And you can make the mistakes that people make uh, as they go along their journey. The nice thing about what the Urban League does is we have a set of proven products, be it for entrepreneurship, be it for housing acquisition, be it for educational attainment, 
uh, you know, just a number of things that we consider to be kind of cornerstones to any successful life. Uh, the Urban League has been around since the early 1900s. Uh, so we've kind of figured out uh, what works, what doesn't, what we can replicate, what people will fund so that when they make the investment in you or others, they know that the likelihood of what the output is going to be because we have a track record of success in these various areas. So the pathway to economic wealth, I think, is through good exchange of information. Uh, I'm so happy that we're doing this video because someone might learn about what we do and that there is this thing called the Urban League. Most people these days have not heard of the Urban League. Uh, but again, it's been around for a long time, but there are so many things competing for people's interests these days. And, uh, you know, the road to progress and success might not be as attractive and sexy as some of the things you can find on TikTok. I get that. So, you know, we've got to be creative about how we reach uh, populations that are essential to our people's success. It's important to generations that I'm a part of and generations that will be following me. Uh, at some point, uh, I'm hopeful that um, you said you want to be a um, chiropractor, no, physical therapist. physical therapist. You know, at some point, I'm going to need a whole lot of physical therapy. And I'd prefer that you'd be the person providing it for me than uh, someone who's less qualified. So why not you? What are some ways that the community partners, such as churches, can help to inspire uh, young, actively young, the youth? to engage in politics, social justice initiatives, and advocacy? I think it, it kind of ties to the, the previous answer. Part of it is don't recreate the wheel. You know, copy success is out there. Copy, copy, copy. The, the models are out there. They're plentiful. Uh, read about uh, people that inspire you. Uh, you know, I mean, it can be very contemporary people. I, I just finished a book uh, about Trevor Noah. You know, he's not a philosopher or some, you know, learned individual that, you know, we typically are told that we have to study. He's a popular comedian. Uh, you know, uh, he, 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 tell, he told his story. Kevin Hart, I read his book. You know, there are people that are out there that you can pick up little gems, little nuggets from that will help you to um, have a successful journey. Uh, I think the church has taken on the responsibility of being the end all and the be all. I think that we have to partnership with all those who are specialists in all of those little segments of the journey so that when the church, when the church gives you that great foundation, they pass you on to the organization that might help you to get your first job. That organization helps pass you along to the person who's gonna help you make good grades in college. That organization then passes you on to those who are going to find you the best job possible based upon your interests. If we work together strategically, uh, we can accomplish great things. I'm so proud of what the black church has done. It is one of the last beacons of consistent hope, dedication, and delivery of our people. But they don't have to work by themselves. We must work together. We used to have something called Urban League Sunday, and Urban League Sunday was uh, one day a year <clears throat> where all the churches in the community raised money for the Urban League to continue doing all the various programs that we do. So the church doesn't have to have the burden of trying to do all the programs that they're doing. So again, I think it's about communications, working together. Um, uh, no one has to lead, everyone has to be a part of the team. And we all don't care about who gets the credit. We care about what happens for you and the generations to come. Uh, that's what makes the community strong. Uh, so I'm very proud of our churches. I'm very proud of Lily Grove. A lot of great people have come out of this church. Lots of great leaders. Uh, but we want to have a stronger relationship. We've had uh, the privilege of working with one of your senior members here for many, many years, who's always tied the Urban League and Lily Grove together. We need to have more relationship like that, where we've got strong people in the church working with strong organizations like the Urban Leagues and others that help do a myriad of great things that make the whole effort more successful. 
What advice do you have for youths regarding how to approach developing life and career goals? You know, I think it's important to find good role models. And good can be defined uh, many ways, but, but really someone who's, who's created a successful, complete life. Not someone who's just successful at age 17 or 18 or 21 or 30, but how did they really take that whole life and make it successful? Um, and again, I go back to, you know, copy, 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 read, 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 find your role models and make sure they are uh, solid in your faith and in your mission, what you believe is core, what your family believes is core to what makes a good human being. Try to make sure they have some of those values. Um, but also, you know, I take, for example, um, someone that everyone knows. And I got a calendar <coughs> a year, oh, many years ago. And the calendar had various influencers or very popular people when you went from month to month. You've seen those type. And each person had a quote. And when you turn to January, which is my birth month, Oprah Winfrey had a quote. And the quote was, surround yourself with people who will lift you higher. Surround yourself with people who will lift you higher. If you're in a circle of influence where someone is not being beneficial to where you're trying to go in life, that person should not be a part of your circle. I always at the Urban League make sure that the people I try to hire are people who are superiorly talented beyond me in spaces where they have passion, be it education or housing or workforce or entrepreneurship, health initiatives. I don't have to do all that. If I can find the right people who can lift the organization to help the people they're trying to serve. So my job as the leader is to find other great leaders. My job is to surround myself with people who will lift the urban league higher. What obstacles have the uh, Robinsons faced to get beyond this point? Like any family, uh, anyone who's trying to do great things, uh, there'll be people who don't believe you're genuine in your attempts to do so. Um, so we've had that. We, we've had, obviously, being a business-oriented family, we've had all of the economic cycles of, of um, highs and lows financially. Um, you know, we've had tragic deaths in the family. We're like any other American family. Uh, but I think the thing is you don't want to get distracted by the haters. I think you want to stay on your path, no matter what. I think you want to show up every day, give it your best, stay focused on your vision, and see it through. Thank you for taking the time out to come answer some questions. Excellent job, Cameron. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lily Grove.